Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to YPO and our Facebook live chat here with John Chambers. I am Scott Mordell, I'm the CEO of YPO, and we're thrilled to be here together to share some ideas and learn a little bit and work from there as we may go. For the next 40 minutes, we're gonna share some ideas about leadership in this age of disruption, and from, we're gonna also open it up to questions from those of you that are listening. So if you send in your questions, we'll, uh, we'll try to get to them if we can. Can't guarantee that, but uh, hopefully we can have a wonderful conversation as we, as we work our way through. And today I have this honor to be with John Chambers, a legend of business, a legend of leadership, and quite frankly, I think a model of the human spirit in the positivity that it can bring to change in the world. So glad you're here, John. Um, Scott, it's a pleasure. Far from perfect, but <laughs> it's an honor to be with you all today. Thank you very much. And just a little bit about yeah. John, uh, because he's, he's been there, done that in so many different ways, which makes him a wonderful teacher for us today. During his 20 years at Cisco, he's grown the organization from 70 million in revenue to 47 billion when he left the organization in his, in his 20 years. He's experienced so many different downturns, um, uh, five major downturns and six very significant um, market transitions as it would go, and he's grown the company through that. All through that time, there were more than 180 acquisitions that uh, he, he oversaw and led the organization through, and it's Wonderful when um, one can look back and say that most of the competitors that you had when you started don't, have ceased to exist. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's truly fantastic. Um, with that, um, John's got a recent book, came out last week, and it's called Connecting the Dots, Leadership, I should show it, shouldn't I? Leadership uh, for a Startup World. And it came out last week. I've had a chance to uh, um, spend some time with it. I'm a hard copy person. I get a book and I mark it up because that's how I learn. But it's also available in audio format and electronic format, so they can carry it with me as, as we begin to work from there. So thank you, John, for being here today. And Scott, thank it's you. an honor to be back with the organization. I think last was March 2017 when I talked to a, a number of your members. Yeah, that was our in-person, and it's yeah. been very good. You were wonderful from this room, I believe, actually, John. Uh, in our Innovation Week, you did a global webcast, which you had some Q&A with a number of our members uh, and Anna Shin from, uh, um, from the local bureau here. Mm -hmm. And it's just been great content. And the fact that we can continue to talk about different things with mm -hmm. you uh, really, I think, lay out the framework of you being a, a teacher uh, for us mm -hmm. um, and, and for the world. So, so thank you for that. Well, it's an honor. I'll try to not let you down. The good news is <laughs> I've seen every movie there is to see, uh, and I've done some things right, made a lot of mistakes, and sharing those perhaps so you, your audience can say, all right, lessons learned, this one I can avoid or this one I can leverage. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So to start us off, it's, sure. it's, we're having a lot of discussion in YPO now about yeah how the expectations and roles in many ways of CEOs have changed literally in the recent times because of all of the disruption yes. and everything else that's happening. And I'm curious, from your perspective, how would you say things have changed for uh, YPO, YPOers uh, out there, but as well as CEOs everywhere in terms of how things have changed? Well, one of the reasons I wrote the book is I tended to get the same questions regularly, yeah. and I thought, well, this is a way to teach, and here are the questions I get, and here are the answers, and here's my mistakes made. But in terms of the core requirements of a CEO, I would argue those are the same. Mm -hmm. Their importance, however, is varying dramatically, and the speed at which they're occurring is varying dramatically. So a CEO in today's world, or a president in today's world, number one, vision and strategy for the company. Mm -hmm. Number two is to develop, recruit, retain, and change that leadership team as appropriate. And as you go, that's one of the hardest things to do as a leader. Number three uh, is literally culture. And I know as a young CEO, I probably did not put as much emphasis as I should have on that, and I kind of backed into right. how important culture was. And number four is communicate. The communication is at an entirely different speed today. Mm -hmm. And this is where you could be a Jack Welch from many years ago, not be a very good communicator, and he would tell you he's not, uh, and yet be one of the greatest CEOs of the 1970s and 80s. Today's world, you've got to be able to listen to social media. You've got to be out there when the bumps come along the way and be a great communicator. And it will go at about three to five times the speed of business just two decades ago. Incredible. Th thank you. And with YPO, yeah. um, we're recognizing very much that the world needs better leaders. Some people forget the fact that business and commerce ultimately pay for everything that happens around the globe. Creates um, all the jobs. Exactly. And uh, the world needs our leaders to, to bring those businesses together and do different things. And through YPO, mm -hmm. we actually connect across uh, geopolitical boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, we're non-political. We're all about the leadership and the, the way that they can improve in the organization. Yes. And so in that sense, um, this is an um, important mission and purpose of us as an organization 
But ultimately, each individual takes it for him or herself as, as they begin to go forward. Yes. And with that, what I loved about the book is uh -huh. how you're really creating a replicable pay playbook that people can work with in order to repeat practices in order to actually succeed in this time. So would you speak to the, the, the playbook and how, how that's come about? Yeah, I actually kind of, again, backed into it. Yeah. Uh, as we started to do things, I realized uh, I used to consider uh, process like bureaucracy and it was mm. bad. Yeah. And boy, was I wrong. Yeah. You're ne never able to scale with speed without process behind it, but right. you've got to design it for speed. And so one of the first things I designed was how do you do acquisitions? Right. And uh, we literally came up with our seven golden rules of here's how you do acquisitions. Right. Understand what you're buying and protect it at all costs. Uh, only do it if it has tremendous strategic importance to you because they're really hard. Uh, only acquire companies with similar cultures, something that I did not think about until I got into it. Uh, further, only do it if you can retain the people because you usually pay such a premium, you won't get the end product out for the next generation. So we developed that playbook ran it again and again yeah. through 180 yeah. acquisitions. And I, I think most everybody in the industry would say we, we are the model that they teach at Stanford or at Harvard yeah. on how to do acquisitions. But we did the same thing on everything from how you recruit people, uh, how you digitize countries, how you deal with a problem in a customer account, how do you deal with a Cisco family member, uh, now my startup family member, that has a crisis either mm -hmm. for themselves, their spouse, or their children. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And we have some conversation mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about organizations, when we're talking outside of YPO and outside of the leadership space. Yes. We'll just remind people that there's an organization really only has four parts to it. There's some sense of purpose in terms of what it's trying to accomplish. Yes. People come together for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And then they need to have some processes so that the, all the people come together have more impact than they would have individually. Okay? Could not agree And then more. we need some capital, right? So, yeah. so that's all got to come together. So with it, it ends up yeah. coming being people that, that actually uh, revolve around the mission and come together with the processes and, and, and bring the capital. So let's talk about culture for a minute in okay. terms of are, are, are CEOs paying enough attention to culture? What, 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 what can our listeners, our CEO listeners do about that? When um, uh, Any advice you would have in that regard? Well, it, it, when I became a CEO, I, I didn't really appreciate how important culture was, even mm -hmm. though I was already building it very strongly in right. the company on how I interface to customers and how I interface to employees that had a crisis, uh, how I focused on innovation. But I then realized that I've never seen a great company without a great culture. You may or may not like the culture to Microsoft right. or an Oracle or a Cisco or Walmart or JP Morgan Chase, but you always see very strong cultures. And for Cisco as an example, the culture is who we are. It's got to be owned by the CEO. Mm -hmm. The CEO has to believe the culture, has to walk the talk and articulate it. And it's got to be easy to understand. It can't be vague things. And right. when you're a young company with 20 or 30 people and you're growing, uh, people kind of understand that, and it's an understanding of what the CEO, she or he, wants for culture. Uh, once you begin to get to the break points, 15, uh, five, 500, 1,500, 5,000, right. uh, you have to have a process where people understand what your culture is. And it can't be soft. Hmm. It's got to be really it is. And you, if you read your culture, you should know which company you're talking about. Right. So at Cisco, it was changed the way the world works, lives, learns, and plays. First element of our values, make innovation happen. Uh, second is treat customers uh, as the top priority every moment of what we do. Uh, we are a family. That's not mm -hmm. to say that every company should view it that way, mm -hmm. but I sure did at Cisco. Right. Knew every illness of every employee was there for them like no one else in terms of the approach. Uh, also, basically, just do the right thing. And right. it was so important and got, kept us out of trouble in so many different areas. So to your point, you play for a larger value than just selling your products. Right. You articulate that. And then you say, what is your culture to make it happen? Mm -hmm. uh, now, that doesn't mean that many companies won't be successful who believe culture is not about family. Right. Uh, and Netflix was a great company. They're a professional team. Mm -hmm. You either get promoted and you're up and out or right. not, but I encourage you to look at their cultural deck and you you can learn from what various companies uh, focus on. One of my most exciting things about coaching these young CEOs is that they get vision and strategy pretty quickly and I can mm -hmm. help them on that and I can really help them develop and scale their team. And I work on the communications, right. often doing interviews together right. and teaching them how do you sandwich a question, how do you deal with a really tough question with humor, right. uh, how do you deal with really tough questions. If it's emotional, you deal with facts. Uh -huh. If it's factual, you deal with an emotion. Right. But the culture one is often they kind of look at you and go like the dog does when it doesn't understand what you're <laughs> saying to your pet. And then when they finally get it, and they really understand the detail behind it and the power behind it. And then they try it with their employees or customers and they see it. That is what 
coaching is all about. It's what mentorship is about. Thank you very much. And, you know, even in my intro, I was talking mm -hmm. about all basically a picture of the successes that you've had and, and just yeah. talking about the growth and the leadership. Yeah. And it's a part of why you're such a legend. But in our conversations and very much in the book, you talk yeah. about the, the value of setbacks versus successes. And so for you, um, yeah. what's more important to you, the setbacks and what have you learned the most from? And can you share a couple that would help people um, sure. really understand the context? And this this I did not get as a young leader. And by the way, I never wanted to have any setbacks uh -huh. or any mistakes. And I realized if you're taking risks, you're going to have setbacks and mistakes and you're not going to succeed without taking them. And uh, if you would have asked me 20 years ago, are you more a product of your successes or your setbacks? I would have said successes. Mm -hmm. And they're a lot more fun to talk about, as we all sure. know. But one of the things you all do with your program is you exchange views and practices. Uh, everybody's going to get knocked on their tail. Right. Most companies never get back up, including the CEO. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to realize you are more a product, or at least equal to, how you handle your setbacks than your successes. And uh, I navigated through five major downturns right. at Cisco, some of them partially self-inflicted, some economically mm -hmm. inflicted. And you develop a playbook for that as well. Right. When the setback comes, how much of it was self-inflicted versus market? Was your strategy working? Uh, how long would it last? How deep would it be? Where do you want to go? And get that playbook rerunning with speed. For those of you who are parents, you know where I'm going with this. You don't worry when your child gets a good grade or they score a goal in soccer. You worry when they get knocked down, mm -hmm. either socially or hit problems in life. For me, it was dyslexia. And if you learn to come through that, then you get your, your child becomes a young adult. Right. And so learning how you deal with setbacks, I think, is very important for all of us. And knowing that's where most companies get into trouble. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we've got a question from, from uh, the people outside. So uh, thank you. Yes, we have one from our YPOer, Aaron McCardle. He said, I just got my copy of Connecting the Dots. I have it in my bag now. The first story is about fishing rod is amazing. So I love to see your role. However, I'm struggling with how much to share with my team as we navigate trials. Any insight on that? So I, I started with a near-death experience. And at six years old, I fell in the water uh, rapids at uh, uh, Elk River in, in Charleston, West Virginia. And uh, I could have drowned. My dad was about 100 yards upstream, and he had told me not to get too close to the edge. And, of course, I got too close to the edge and swept away in the rapids. And when I went in, he yelled at me, hold on to the fishing pole. And I'm getting plummeted through the rapids, uh, getting knocked over, coming up for air. And each time I came up, I could see him running down the side of the river as fast as he'd go, yelling, hold on to the fishing pole. And finally, he I got to a point where he could swim out and grab me and pull me back in. And uh, he set me down, and he's, he te he's a great teacher, right. and I try to be as well. But he taught me at that time, you can't fight current whether it's rapids and outgoing tide, economic trends. What you've got to do as a leader is know you're going to have the fear, but learn to control it. Right. Hold on to the fishing pole is my words on it. And how you manage that. And then look for how you navigate through the challenge you got yourself into, usually by going with the current mm -hmm. and then working your way to the side. Right. And people drown because they fight the tide or they fight the current on that. And then he did what any great teacher does. He didn't tell mom this, but he put me right back in the rapids. <laughs> Let me go through it again. You go, you go. And yeah. watched me pull myself out. And then he went back to fishing and he went 100 yards upstream again. And what he was telling me is he believed in me. Mm -hmm. So I believe stories are the way that you convey this. And as a leader, as a young president, You've got to let your team go through that as well, and you've got to teach them. And you've got to know when do you need to do things for them, but when do you need to just give them ideas and empower them to do it. But that's a lesson learned all the way through life, and it's one of the reasons I love being a leader. I love building great teams, but I enjoy teaching them how to handle their challenges, not just their successes. That's great. And in working past these setbacks, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're talking about some kind of reflection, and, and many yes. CEOs just keep going, right? They'll move from thing to thing, or they'll just keep going. They'll be in the details. How have you created a reflection space for yourself, or how do you think yeah. about this, or make room as you're doing, going through this? Well, you've already got the way I approach life. Okay. Uh, I basically try to learn from every experience. I believe you learn from everybody in life. Nobody's above you, nobody's below mm -hmm. you. But you learn from the experiences, and then you learn how to share it, not just the story, right. But one of the reasons I wrote the chapters like I did at the end, you hear the stories, and then at the end, it's what's your takeaway. So the way you deal with setbacks is what I said before. Right. 
in the balance. And then you teach people how to deal with it. You also want people to take risk. And if right. each of you are watching this, uh, first time somebody takes a risk and they fail, you fire them or smack right. them, you're not going to have a company that takes right. risk. Right. You've got to realize you want to create a culture where people dream and you want to get them comfortable for being beyond their comfort mm -hmm. zone regularly. And uh, that's what I now enjoy doing. I didn't like it at yeah. first when my team would push me outside my comfort zone. Now, actually, I enjoy it a lot. Thank you. You're touching right on something that's very important to, to okay. YPOers and the nature of our organization. We bring together really extraordinary people, um, mm -hmm. and they've, they've had business success at an early age. So we're taking people who have had yes. accelerated success, and ultimately we're trying to help them accelerate it even faster. Yes. And so one of the things when we bring them together, we try to make it safe so that yes. people will actually share and feel comfortable and, and all the things Learn that from matter. from each other's successes exactly. and mistakes. Exactly. Yeah. And then we try to stimulate the conversations and do things. And one of the elements in the book that really struck me uh, very wonderfully and mm -hmm. better vocabulary than we've been using mm -hmm. is actually this idea about the teenage mind. Okay. Oh. Because you're talking about dreaming and yeah. thinking big. And, and yeah. would you speak to uh, help explain sure. to everybody what that means? Sure. There's one chapter in there. And, and part of this I got from Shimon Perez. Mm -hmm. uh, he's one of the greatest leaders I've ever met, a friend for 17 years. I miss him every day. Mm -hmm. And I've met every leader there is in the <laughs> world. And uh, he taught me more than, than anybody did in many ways. Uh, he taught me leadership was lonely. And I thought it wasn't lonely in 2001, boy, was oh, he right. right. And uh, he also taught me to think like a teenager. And much like your teenagers, those of you that have children that age, they do all kinds of things at the same time. Multi-press, tremendous speed, eating, uh, exchanging things on social media, doing their homework sometimes, right. <laughs> talking to you at the dinner table. You almost have to text them to say, hey, I'm ready for the next conversation. Right. But having that process of just so many things and gathering the data so quickly, I think is the future mm -hmm. for leaders. And uh, then thinking like a dyslexic, because dyslexics can't do things thoroughly. You gather the data and you have to picture the outcome. Oh, okay. And so one of the chapters talks about what are the lessons learned on that and how do you deal with your setbacks and then make a setback a strength. Uh, I used to be one of the worst public speakers imaginable. And uh, I realized that to be a good CEO, I had to get much better. And I used to throw up before I presented. Yeah. I mean, that's how scared I got. And I learned to overcome those fears and then focus on how do you communicate much like I'm looking somebody right in the eye and talking to them about what's important mm -hmm. and never memorizing a speech because I'll lose my spot on it being right. dyslexic because I read backwards. But take a weakness and make it a strength. And then once you do that, it's like the lessons with the kids. You get stronger and stronger on that. And then teaching people how to, to balance that as well. Right. Thank you. Fantastic. And so... In your progression, mm -hmm. you, very many um, experiences from within the organization and Shimon Perez and, and everything else, but um, we're all also realizing that the CEO is a pretty lonely role. And, and, and so where does one go for, for support and, and who do they bounce ideas yeah. off and who do they get honest feedback back to? So could you yeah. tell a little bit about your network uh, of peers as you kind of bounce things up and, and, and progress as you've gone? Well, it, it shaped what I'm literally doing today yeah. because I learned early on, whether it was from my dad or from my mom or, or people I met early in life about lessons learned. And so I developed mentors and I'd spend a lot of time with them. And I didn't hesitate about asking for help right. uh, on it. Lou Platt here in Silicon Valley, when uh -huh. I came out here, I didn't know the Valley. He was president of Hewlett Packard. Uh, I was running a company called Cisco, which most people got confused with the truck company, the food company. Right. And I called him up and I said, would you spend time with me? And he did. Then at the end of the session, I said, would you do it again next quarter? He coached me for three years. Okay. After that, I asked, what can I do for HP? Because we were on a roll by then. He said, mm -hmm. do it for the next generation. So I've learned how important coaching and mentoring is. Uh, I literally have, I have people in very high positions that have been very good coaches and people that are individual contributors, very good coaches and, and balanced. So you know, whether it's uh, Bill Clinton, even though... He's a Democrat, <laughs> and you and I are moderate Republicans, uh, or George Bush, right. uh, a Henry Kissinger, uh, or literally a Condi Rice. And so I've, I always try to get mentors who can help develop me, and that's what I do for my startups. Right. And with the startups, and by the way, I get mentors from customers who might be buried deep in the organization who really understand technology or security. And then I build a trusting relationship where they help guide me. I'm now trying to do that with the startups because I realize as companies wait longer and longer to go public, or some companies never will, how do you get mentors who've seen the movie so many times before? Because right. I've seen this movie. I mean, I've seen it going from mainframes to mini computers to PC to the internet to digitization. And to your points, 
all the peers that I competed against are almost all gone or right. a shadow of what they were before. And having been through that, helping people understand what is natural and how do you develop, and it is so lonely. It is literally sitting out in this porch looking at, at the sky and going, how am I going to navigate through this? And knowing that my team expects the leader to be like a rock during this. So right. getting people that can kind of, you can trust to say, what do you think? Have you seen this movie before? What are the trade-offs? Right. And this is a good bridge into um, really a, mm -hmm. a theme that we're trying to emphasize and realizing how important it is for CEOs is to is to carry this air of authenticity and be trustworthy, right? It and is. so so it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes CEOs will get out in front on something and they'll be afraid of that. And yet at the same time, the only mm -hmm. way they can be authentic is actually to speak their mind. So how do you, do you have any yeah. views for us relative to that uh, contradiction? Uh, yeah, I actually do. I, I think the currency of a CEO or the currency of the company she or he represents uh, is all about trust. Mm -hmm. It's all about track record and it's all about relationships. Right. And so I think the currencies of the future will be those combination of those three factors. And so how you develop that trust, and it doesn't mean you won't make mistakes, but people right. trust you, how you literally I have the track record of delivering on your commitments right. and how you also build the relationships and capabilities with it. I did all my acquisitions on a handshake yeah. and it used to drive the lawyers crazy, but I'd get a call on a Thursday night to talk about speed uh, from the head of the NASDAQ and he said, John, you're an idiot. And I said, all right, now what did I do wrong? <laughs> and he said, you should be acquiring this company and your competitors have been there six to 12 months. It's now public knowledge. Somebody's going to buy them probably for three billion plus here in the next week. And you should. And I was embarrassed. I didn't even know what the company did. Oh my. And the good news is my business development person didn't know either. But when I had him go over the next morning to meet with the CEO, he called me in an air and said, John, get over here. I got over by lunch. We had a handshake for a $3 billion acquisition through both boards of directors, announced on Monday, had all the personnel situations, the top contracts already worked out. Now, that's speed through process, uh -huh. but it also is a track record. He knew my reputation on acquisitions. Once I gave him my word, I would be there. I would not let him down. He knew how good we were about keeping our attrition of acquired companies only 4% voluntary. Right. Nobody comes close to that. It runs 20 in this industry. And so your, your trust your track history of it, and then the ability to build relationships where they can back channel you very quickly, right. I think are the currencies for your people listening today. Fantastic. Thank you. I believe we've got a question from one of our viewers. We have a question from Brady Kazar. Organizational culture is hard to change. What are the one or two things you think helps kickstart that change? Mm -hmm. I think the number one thing is the CEO, she or he, must own it. This isn't something a group can get together right. and you visit once a year or you give it to your human resource person. <laughs> That's the kiss of the death and it's unfair to the HR lead. Uh, the CEO has to own it and you've got to be realistic what your culture is. You may not like a culture at Uber, but boy, right. it was strong. Mm -hmm. And you had to understand what it was if you were joining them. Uh, it is important that if your culture gets off track versus what the CEO really believes, they've got to take a step back share with the team why they're going back to the basics, remind people what the culture is. I actually put it on their badges because even my top execs had trouble remembering make innovation happen, mm -hmm. treat people like family. Right. Customers first, always. Right. Just do the right thing. Right. Change the way the world works, lives, learns, and plays. We're not selling routers and switches. We're selling the mm -hmm. future with the internet. Mm -hmm. And you've got to regain it. You also need to share with your group that you let it get away from you, and you've got to say it's my ownership, and then you've got to walk the talk. Right. Because your people will see through it as well as your customers if you say, here's our culture, and when you're out there, especially under pressure, you go a different way. Absolutely. And uh, one thing that will keep all of you out of trouble, that basic comment about just do the right thing, if you make that a core part of your values and culture, it will keep you out of trouble. It will also help you make the decisions uh, in ways that not. Thank you. Moving into some decision making in an important space um, yeah. is artificial intelligence, AI, yes. and yeah. it's uh, in some ways everybody's talking about it. I'm not sure everybody's uh, got a handle on it necessarily, what it means to them and their leadership. Sure. And I, I know you've got some views on this. We were talking in and around yeah. that. I'd love for you to share with everybody a way to think about that. Yeah, the, the, the space of change with digitization, when we move from a thousand devices connected to the internet when Cisco is found to about 20 billion today on its way to 500 billion, that information is going to come at you at tremendous speed. Mm -hmm. And really what digitization accomplishes with AI is it gets the right information at the right time to the right person or machine to make the right decision. Right. Really simple premise, right. hard to really do. Every company, I don't care if you're in healthcare, manufacturing, uh, government, uh, every company will become a technology digital company. 
And that's a nice way of saying that it'll be a virtual and a physical world going forward. And you've got to understand the major trends. A lot of the buzzwords, blockchain, et cetera, are kind of interesting. Right. But artificial intelligence with digitization will transform every company, drive huge productivity, but also huge change, leave you exposed to disruption, either uh -huh. from big guys or smaller guys. And so understanding how technology plays within this and how do you learn it yourself and it will make you uncomfortable at first for most of us. I didn't originally like technology. Uh, you know, in, in graduate school, uh, I had a friend that helped me with the computer programming, okay. and, and I helped him with his business okay. uh, analysis. And I ended up in tech just by accident, mainly because I realized what it can do for you or to you. Right. And so the challenge for each of you is get a competent that helps train you on technology, uh, either within your company or outside, and you unfortunately have no choice. Uh, if you're not a tech company 10 years from now with digitization, you're dead. And so you've got to both balance. Are you retail? Are you healthcare? Are you government? But say, how does it fit in? Great. That should make some of our viewers uncomfortable, which I think it is sure a good does. Thing. It made me yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. It really did. Absolutely. Thank you. I think we've got a question from a viewer. We have a question from Toby Reed from British Columbia. He said he took his first company public in 2015 and currently working on his next startup. Um, his question is to actually both of you. Um, our world is increasingly driven by business people who struggle with integrity, meaning doing the right thing versus doing the most profitable thing. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with coaching who struggle with integrity? Why don't you go first? Well, thank you. Uh, to me, it's... That's a, one of the lessons. Whenever you get a tough topic, uh, <laughs> you buy a little bit of time, you think about what you want your answer to be. I'm buying time for Scott and for me to think about it. Uh, then I have fun humor-wise to give you the first one. <laughs> You're teaching every step along the way. To me, we're recognizing that the CEO's role and obligation is actually to serve multiple stakeholders now. And so, yes, it, when I grew up, it was very much just about solely profits and all the rest. But to be successful, to be meaningful, and to be valued for anything more than the short-term time period is to be respectful and honoring all of the different stakeholders of the organization. And so that should put somebody into the mind that we're here to serve all of the stakeholders, all of the impact of our organization. And when you think about how we impact all of them, uh, are you really, really willing to short circuit a, a positive benefit uh, for, for your stakeholders uh, in order just to make profit and have that come back and get you? Because as John had shared, authenticity and transparency end up being true. Everybody ends up finding it out eventually, and it's going to be part of your price. So you're better off to be working with integrity, acting with the purpose to serve all of your stakeholders, and uh, be committed to that, and build a support network around you so you can stay true to that. John? I think it's one of the top issues facing business leaders around the world, especially the large companies. And we've seen this with some of the social media companies who, candidly, have not executed well right, on this. Right. And uh, uh, I believe, first of all, that uh, it's not just the right thing to do, it's just good for business. Mm -hmm. uh, every place in the world where I was number one in corporate social responsibility, and we won every every award there was uh, from a Democratic president or Republican president yeah. in the U.S. to the Middle East, to China, to India. Uh, wherever we did a good job of being transparent and giving back, we were number one in market share. Uh, the second issue, and there's one chapter in the book about this, only sell customers what they really need, but mm -hmm. I'm talking customers, citizens, government, right. and this is where if you do the, and don't fall to the trap of short-term profits, you actually would do much better and make more profits long-term. Mm -hmm. And I do think that if companies don't stay focused on doing the right thing and giving back and understanding that society has fair challenges for us, uh, then we'll suffer an awful tough uh, outcome because we will get regulated. It doesn't matter if you're in Canada, U.S., France, China, etc. So I think it's the right thing to do, but I think it's very important that we must be role models. And, mm -hmm. and right now, sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. And Silicon Valley is struggling with that at the present time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We got another question from a viewer. Yes, Thank you, Tony. The Toby. question is Paolo Ernesto is asking John, how do you see autonomous digital driving in respect to global digital transformation? Oh, I think this is the example that all of us can take artificial intelligence and translate it to something we know. Right. To where when you get in the car in the future, you suddenly would just get in. It's like going to be like your home. Your music will turn on. Your entertainment will come, turn on. There won't even be a steering wheel. Right. Uh, you say where you want to go. It won't be activated by a key or even an AI type sign. It will be probably activated by your voice. Voice will come back as the best mm -hmm. authentication on it. Uh, it will transform everything, safety, etc. Going to be huge, huge progress in terms of the approach. 
Now, I occasionally dream too big, too early. We did that demo at Consumer Electronics Show 15 years ago in Vegas. <laughs> and we showed what the cars of the future are like, but I was a little bit ahead of my headlights on bit. it. <laughs> and it's important to have people around you help balance it. But I think that's the example where you use chips from NVIDIA and a really hot startup, and you're going to use radar capability that's coming down dramatically in price to be able to mm. see things. And then you're going to gather data from everything around you that provides information. And so it's just beginning. And while you think what today is doing is rocket science, it's baby steps compared to yeah. what's going to happen here. I think it's the best example of how technology will transform automobiles. I had the chance to talk to Ford and GM and many of the global automobile companies going back about seven or eight years ago. And I tried to share with them that if they didn't become a technology company, a digital company, if they didn't move dramatically quicker and move to different business models, they were going to get disrupted. And while they were very polite and a good, healthy give and take on the meetings, uh, the message was, was mm -hmm. hard to get through. And uh, the, the message that Uber will be your competitor, right. shared assets will be your competitor, that a Tesla will come from almost nowhere and overtake you. And just to give your, your viewers the data that goes with it and how fast things are accelerating, I was on the Walmart board of directors. Uh, the Walton family is amazing, oh, great man. company, just does the right thing uh -huh. most all the time. Uh, we saw Amazon coming. We could not get ahead of them. 21 years hmm. took Amazon to pass this in market cap, but they did. Tesla overtook GM and Ford in 14 years. Uber overtook Tesla in seven. You know where I'm going, 21, 14, seven. That's the speed of change each one of you have to deal with. And you've got to understand your competitors of the future won't be the competitors of the past. And what will get you in trouble is doing the right thing for too long. You've got to have the courage to dream, to disrupt yourself, create an environment for risk taking, or we won't survive. 40% of the companies watching this podcast will not be here in 10 years, maybe 50. Even more uncomfortable now. Thank you. Good. Uh, that's, that's important. When you're uncomfortable, you change. <laughs> Absolutely. This is true. So thinking about change and thinking yes. about our viewers paying attention to us uh, and, and thinking about what they're going to do next, what advice would you have for them in terms of a, a life hack, what they can do next based on some of these theming be, beyond reading the book and beginning to think big about it? But what can okay. they do more specifically? Do you have any a couple nuggets we can take away here? I have a couple nuggets. Uh, uh, the first is you want an innovation playbook for almost everything right. you do. Right. Uh, and that allows you, instead of being bureaucratic, it allows you to move with tremendous speed. Uh, the other thing is get outside your comfort zone. Right. Dare to dream. And you, people might be critical of me, Scott, saying I dream too big and, and try to do too many things at once. After thinking about it, and it's fun now that I can be independent, I actually think I should have dreamed bigger and take more risks, and I'm doing that with my startups. I mean, right. I'm so far outside my comfort zone on startups, it will shock you uh, with what they can convey and the approach that we use. Uh, the other life hack is take time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Finish your meeting, summarize it, do the bathroom, make the phone calls, get the next meeting off to fast start. It sounds basic. But if there's one, one takeaway, it's all about the ability to have a vision, a strategy where you want to go, build the team around it, and how you're going to use technology in that, and the importance the CEO plays in that. Fantastic. You know, we were talking about a couple of the startups that you're mm -hmm. excited about now, and mm -hmm. this might be when you start thinking about it so differently. Yes. Uh, um, uh, why don't we talk about those? Okay. I would love so, to, because yeah. I have ones that, that do social media, and I have ones that do security, yeah. but two that might shock you and kind of give you an idea how far outside my comfort level I go regularly. Uh, the first one is, this gets announced today, it's a company called Provora. You basically, it's a secure case for all phones. It will start with the iPhone and then go beyond it. You slide your phone straight into this, you close it, it is nation state hack proof. And right. so with your phones today, anybody can, with a little bit of expertise, can dial in, turn on your audio, uh, actually run your cameras, whether you're at home or in a meeting. They come listening points in businesses. They can download your email, mm -hmm. watch your strokes that you're using, et cetera, which is why most events agencies won't even allow smartphones in their buildings anymore. Right. And uh, same things going to happen in business. Uh, this is a company of 17 people. Huh. And when I first saw it, and a friend asked me to look at it out of Arizona, I said, you got to be kidding me. And then once I got it, amazing on what it could be. But that's where the ability to dream, address a real issue with technology changes can be huge. And it was well outside my comfort zone. This, about the time you think that I'm taking too much risk, you want to think about what I'm trying to do next. This is perhaps the solution to world hunger 
And this might be where insects, especially crickets, become the next lobsters in our life. And the first time I met Muhammad, uh, sure, he was out of uh, a company called Aspire, and he was the winner of the Hulk Award. 25,000 companies compete for this each year. He won it. And he said, John, I do cricket farming. Will you coach me and will you invest? And I said, no, uh, I don't understand this. That's so far outside of my sweet spot, etc." But then I realized he isn't a farming organization. It's an Internet of Things, cloud, big data, raises crickets in the most pure form of protein imaginable. Uh, It's the easiest for us to digest. It does one-seventh to one-tenth the environmental damage that the meat that I love does to the world. And it can be the solution for world hunger and typical me. I also said, let's move, make it to the lobsters of the future. So we go to a restaurant like the three-star restaurant here in San Francisco, Cezanne's, and we had a seven-course cricket dinner there with uh, the press watching us do this. So, Scott, I'm going to test your comfort level. I love protein. And you know what I'm doing for all of you all on this. I want you to operate outside your comfort zone. Take risks that you never would have done before. Have the courage. Mm. I'm like a salty potato chip. I love it. This That's is fantastic. barbecue, Texas barbecue. That's fantastic. We have one last question before we go, and um, we'll repeat the question just to make sure everybody can hear it. It's through Whitefield member Mihar Shah. Cisco went through several transitions. How did you keep employees motivated when you have to make tough choices regarding refocusing? Well, I think keeping employees motivated and part of the family is, is one of the things we did best at Cisco. Our attrition rate during the 25 years I was there and only about 5% in Silicon Valley where the attrition rates are, are in low teens. Uh, we were a family, and I alluded to it earlier, and I don't suggest doing that unless you really mean it, but we were a family during the good times and the bad. And when you go through the tough times, every company's going to hit the tough times. Right. So it isn't a question, are you? It's how do you deal with it? You've got to be honest, trust, track record, relationships, and say, here's how much of it was self-inflicted. Uh, here's what we have to do different on that, how right. much we're external. Then you've got to go through how long you think it's going to last and how deep it will be. You don't say this to the employees, but you plan for it to be longer and deeper. And you get your business plan in place. You then basically share with all your constituencies what you're going to look like when you come out. And then you treat people like you'd like to be treated yourself. Your leader has to be out there, has to be visible. And while that sounds basic, almost no companies do it. And then you can run the play with tremendous speed. 2001, I got surprised. Uh, we did all the changes in 51 days. Day 52, we gained share. Wow, fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. And we're, unfortunately, we could go on for hours and hours and hours with this because there's so many things to explore. Mm-hmm. But we're, we're coming to the end of our time. And, and I'd like to turn it uh, back to you, John. Is, okay. is there, If there's one mistake or one learning or something you'd like to point to that we haven't really kicked over uh, relative to some of your other thoughts in and around the, the topics of the book that we could, we could share. But uh, I think one mistake or something that uh, you, we, could, we could part with. I think one that might surprise you. I think it's important as a leader to have balance in life. Mm. And one of the reasons so many people at Cisco stay with me 20, 22, 25 years, and they'll come with me to the new companies I'm moving with, uh, if they've left Cisco, I'll bring them back again to the companies, is we make it fun. Mm-hmm. And we're a work hard culture, and I don't make any apologies for that, but we also have fun together. We, I think my leader's fishing in Alaska at my expense. Uh, and I, so I think it's for you leaders out there, uh, to realize your team will feed off your energy, and uh, it's important, especially during tough times, to show that you're having fun and help them have fun. So I think you you are the future of this world. You said it well in your introductory comments. Mm-hmm. Uh, without the businesses, there is no standard of living increase. There is uh, no job creation. Uh, there is no chance to do many of the things we talked about. So you're our heroes. Have fun with it, and if you take away one thing, Remember, it's all about trust and doing the right thing. Thank you very much, John. And I just want to remind everybody, the book is called Connecting the Dots. It's, a, it's got a Trevor Trove of information and the kind of things that should trigger conversations to help us all get better. Because after all, transforming the world through our businesses and through our work and through the people that we get to know um, is really a fun thing to do. So thank you for everybody for joining us. Thank you again, John. And uh, we wish everybody pleasure. good day, good evening, and uh, good night. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.